still work in progress, so comments and feedback is very much welcome. Let's see. Okay. So, um, you know, probably don't need to persuade this audience of the, um, you know, widespread um, problems that are associated with the grabbing hand of government. Um, you know, uh, all of these things are going to be talked about much in the next uh, two days. Um, however, uh, less attention has been given to how entrepreneurs cope with the grabbing hand of government. And, um, you know, as uh, uh, is, is pretty clear to this audience, um, you know, in countries, in developing countries where you have, um, you know, a very heavy-handed state uh, with all kinds of regulations and permits and things like that that you need to get, uh, entrepreneurship is all but impossible without the aid of political connections. Um, there's been a flurry of recent work on uh, political connections and firms. Uh, almost all of it has been uh, uh, empirical and most of it has been in finance. Uh, for example, uh, a couple of um, you know, papers in this literature. Uh, there have been a number of uh, papers which have linked um, political connections to the stock market value of firms. Um, some papers have uh, uh, looked at how uh, political connections enable firms to get preferential access to credit or preferential terms uh, uh, in, in credit. Um, you know, political connections have also helped firms get preferential access to uh, bailouts in the wake of, um, you know, IMF assistance programs. Um, but most of this literature, the current sort of empirical literature, um, defines uh, politically connected firms in terms of direct connections between firms and political parties. So, um, you know, political connections are mostly defined uh, in terms of whether uh, a large shareholder or a top-level officer of the company um, uh, is a member of parliament, a minister, or closely related to a top politician or political party, or that the firm is a member of a large and influential business group. Um, but less attention has been uh, given to how entrepreneurs, small business owners, you know, the little guys uh, cope with uh, the sort of, uh, you know, grabbing hand of government, the government frictions, the frictions which government imposes on entrepreneurship, and so on. And so that's the kind of uh, context that we want to focus on. Um, by and large, uh, so our starting premise uh, is that for entrepreneurs or small businesses, uh, little uh, people, so to speak, um, the source of political connections is usually uh, a person or, you know, an entrepreneur who heads a firm uh, is a person's um, social network. Um, in developing countries, um, uh, social networks are usually grounded in a combination of geographic and ethno-linguistic characteristics. So affiliation or eligibility in social networks is usually a result of the accident of birth, uh, but the investment and nurturing of network affiliation is a matter of choice. So, for example, it might be that I come from a particular community in, uh, uh, in Mysore, um, but if I need uh, help from my social network, and if I've never really invested in this social network or never really sort of tried to uh, make um, sort of investments or commitments to this political, to this social network, it's less likely that in my time of need, they're really going to sort of, uh, you know, stick their neck out for me or really try to work uh, to reduce government frictions. So the response of uh, one social network is a function of the time or resources invested in the network. And that's why we call it a social network, essentially, uh, because as, as opposed to a group, uh, you know, the extent to which uh, the network responds to your need for, um, uh, uh, you know, political influence to reduce government frictions uh, is proportional in some way to the amount of time or resources you've invested in this uh, network. So we think of this, uh, you know, the, the time or resources you invest in cultivating or nurturing your, uh, uh, you know, link to the social network as the strength of ties to the social network. And this is why we call this uh, sort of um, uh, uh, phenomenon, a social network. So, however, um, this creates a trade-off for an entrepreneur. 
So the time or resources invested in nurturing your link or strength of ties to the social network um, means less time or resources invested in entrepreneurship. Uh, and by entrepreneurship, what we are, you know, we're taking a very simple sort of approach to this in this model. And basically we mean, um, you know, factors that might enhance the likelihood of success in product market competition. Uh, so uh, you can think of this as things such as uh, R&D, product design, product differentiation, things that make you different and differentiated from other, uh, other products and enhance the likelihood that you will be more successful in market competition. So this creates a trade-off for, for the entrepreneur, as you can obviously see. Uh, you can either invest in uh, product differentiation, um, R&D, uh, you know, product design, these kinds of things, which um, are going to enhance the likelihood of success in product market competition and forego social network investment, or you can forego investment in individual product success and invest in the social network, which in turn will help reduce government friction, uh, you know, which uh, you know, we're going to talk about in this environment. So this trade-off is going to, the balance is going to depend on a number of things, uh, such as the extent of government interference or government friction in the economy, uh, the political influence of the social network to which an entrepreneur belongs, uh, the extent of market opportunities, um, and to some extent, you know, the value or the price uh, that, uh, you, know, you know, how valuable or how profitable uh, the market is uh, in which you compete. So, so, you know, we can think, we think of this sort of uh, research as being related to a couple of broad questions. And this is essentially what motivated us to sort of try and uh, work in this area. One question is, of course, it's related to the determinants of entrepreneurship in uh, developing countries. But another uh, interesting question, which has become a little bit tangential to uh, the model and the paper, but we'd like to return to it later, is the question of how uh, economic liberalization and modernization affects the strength of ties to uh, sort of your sort of uh, ethno-linguistic or regional uh, social network. Because, um, you know, essentially, if you think about the fact that in the U.S. you're always told, uh, you know, you're, you should be an individual, be different, think different. You know, your identity is that of an individual, whereas in many developing countries it used to be the case that your primary identity was the identity of the uh, sort of social network or group that you belong to. You know, you were either, you know, sort of a member of a community and it was important, your primary identity was linked to uh, your affiliation in this kind of um, uh, social network. But anecdotally, perhaps some of you will identify with the uh, uh, sort of notion that as a country like India, there are other countries like South Africa and uh, Brazil we're trying to uh, look at, you know, as these countries are developing and uh, modernizing, there is a sense that the strength of ties to social networks is beginning to fray a little bit uh, uh, for various reasons. So that's another question that we that motivated us uh, uh, in this area, but it's become a little bit tangential. I'll return to it at the end of the um, uh, talk if I have a little bit of time. So we have a very simple model that tries to think about some of these questions. So we have two, uh, two social networks at the moment, call them social network A and social network B. Um, entrepreneurs are drawn from each social network are drawn randomly. Uh, to participate in market competition. Uh, however, um, entrepreneurs ha have a choice of either investing uh, in their uh, tie to the social network or uh, investing in factors which will enhance their uh, likelihood of success in product market competition. And we just call this R&D uh, in the paper, but you can think of it as anything that enhances uh, product differentiation or uh, you know, the ability to be more successful. So, um, so then we have duopoly competition between uh, two firms uh, and each firm comes from a different social network and the reason, the justification for this assumption is that you know, we're interested in markets where uh, individuals or firms from different social networks compete. Uh, that's sort of uh, uh, a premise of uh, the study. Um, on the other hand, um, s the c context we have in mind is that of a country where uh, there are government frictions. So even though you may compete in product market competition, you're still going to need to contend with friction from the government 
uh, which you can think of in terms uh, of time or resources that it takes to get approval of permits or bureaucratic delay uh, for various uh, things and so on. And the social network can help you, can exert political influence and perhaps reduce this, this government friction. So um, success depends both on investment in uh, product market success as well as uh, um, reducing government friction. Uh, sorry? Um, so initially we, so the two uh, firms are in duopoly competition with each other. Um, each firm belongs to a different social network as you'll see in a moment. The two so social networks have different degrees of political influence and um, uh, and it's possible for both firms to gain, uh, you know, approval or, or reduce government friction. That's the way we have it at the moment. Initially, we had it as a contest, uh, but that is very technically difficult to deal with. As you'll see, um, let me just explain the details of the model. So, um, so entrepreneurs compete in duopoly markets. Um, payoff depends both on success in R&D competition and political reducing political friction, which comes from political influence. Um, entrepreneurial effort affects the probability of success in R&D uh, com competition, and there's a prize, a market prize, which we uh, denote by V. Um, however, successful entrepreneurs still get less than V due to governmental interference. The friction can be reduced if an entrepreneur exerts political influence, and the source of political influence for an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur's social network. Um, so I've already talked about this, but just some notation. Um, so at the moment, you know, affiliation in a social network is considered to be mutually exclusive. Um, there are two social networks, A and B, of size N sub A and N sub B. Um, how responsive the social network is to the needs of the entrepreneur depends upon how much the entrepreneur invests in the network. Um, and there are M duopoly markets, which is assumed to be smaller than the number of uh, individuals in uh, any of these social networks. So the entrepreneurs face a resource constraint. We think of this as time. Uh, so they can divide their time between uh, investment in R&D or investment in the social network. Uh, so if you let uh, theta i denote investment in R&D and gamma i denote investment in the social network for entrepreneur i, then you know, the two have to sum up to one. Uh, also, gamma i determines the probability that the social network will help the individual or the entrepreneur when uh, such a need arises. So R&D competition between the two entrepreneurs is modeled as a contest uh, and uh, the probability of success in this R&D uh, contest is just modeled by a simple contest success function where it's basically uh, the extent that you invest uh, divided by the total amount invested by um, you know, all the players, in this case, uh, two players. Uh, uh, each social network has some political influence, which at the moment we just say uh, is denoted by PA for uh, social network A and PB by social network B. Of course, where does this come from? Uh, it's likely to, to depend on a number of things, such as the size of the network, the resources of the network, um, you know, ethnic politics, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, let G denote the size of the government in the economy or an index of government friction in economic transactions. For simplicity, we also uh, use the symbol G to stand for the fraction of uh, sort of firm payoff that the government absorb, uh, absorbs in the absence of political influence. So, you know, in this kind of uh, setup, you can write that the payoff of an entrepreneur uh, I belonging to social network A uh, is V times the probability of success in uh, um, R&D competition. So that's the first, uh, that's the second term in that expression. Now, even if you're successful, um, the government absorbs a fraction G of your output, but this fraction G of output can be reduced if your political, uh, if your social network uh, uh, exerts political influence 
Um, and uh, however, the extent to which the social network will respond uh, to your need for political influence is proportional to your investment in the social network. That's gamma i. So, so you know, if you put these things together, you get a payoff function such as in expression one. And as you can see, if g is equal to zero, then it's basically just uh, R&D competition. So there's no government friction. Again, you know, your success just depends on how much you invest in uh, sort of R&D uh, um, in this model. Again, if uh, there's no government friction, uh, sorry, if you don't invest at all in your social network, then you get uh, you know, the expected output um, times one minus G, because G gets absorbed uh, in terms of government friction. Okay, so the sequence of uh, events is as follows. Entrepreneurs have to de first decide how much to invest in their social network, not knowing whether they're going to be presented with, uh, they're going to be selected for market competition. So, um, so you don't really know whether you're going to need um, sort of political influence, but you have to make the decision of how much to invest uh, knowing this environment, but not knowing specifically whether you yourself will be selected to compete in this duopoly market. Uh, so nature then randomly selects um, an entrepreneur to compete uh, in, in duopoly competition. Um, those who are selected work to be successful in R&D competition. The expected payoff is as in the previous slide. If you're not selected, then basically you work in a traditional sector where output is just constant returns to scale depending upon the amount of time that you invest. So the fallback activity is working in some kind of low return traditional sector. Um, okay. So if you use the resource constraint, then uh, basically you can write that, um, you know, the firm's expected payoff is, um, you know, uh, the small pi i a for uh, individual i belonging to uh, network a times uh, the probability that you will get selected to participate in market competition plus one minus the probability that you'll get selected for market competition times uh, what you, the remaining amount of time that you have left after you've invested in your social network times the uh, uh, sort of uh, return from the traditional sector. So because of the uh, sort of uh, by the resource constraint, basically this boils down to a choice of how much to invest in your social network. Because once you've decided how much you invest in your social network, uh, the remaining amount of time goes to R&D. So, uh, so just because, you know, even in such a simple model, the algebra gets very complicated, uh, you know, it's useful to have this resource constraint. And so an entrepreneur chooses um, how much to invest in the social network. Okay, so then you can get to first order conditions from which you can um, essentially uh, obtain two reaction functions, which are um, individual i, so consider that there are two individuals, i belonging to social network A, j belonging to social network B. Uh, so you can uh, uh, sort of think of two reaction functions, uh, individual i's investment in social network A um, as a function of individual J's investment in social network B, and so on. So just to give you a sense, um, a qualitative sense for the results, not a quantitative sense, uh, we get um, reaction functions such as this, uh, where on, one, on the vertical axis we have uh, investment in the social network by individual I belonging to social network A. On the horizontal axis we have uh, investment by uh, entrepreneur J belonging to social network B. Uh, so you can think of an initial equilibrium such as E1. And then you can think of doing some kinds of comparative statics where uh, you can ask what happens if uh, G changes, um, you know, G standing for government friction, M which is, uh, you know, the number of market opportunities, uh, and V, you know, the sort of value in the market, uh, um, how these things change, and essentially, the qualitative nature of the changes for increases in G, M, and V are similar, uh, basically, and the is also uh, fairly straightforward. So if you think of an increase in government friction, uh, well, you know, I'm going to need, uh, you know, the need for political influence goes up, so I'm going to invest more in my social network. If M increases, also it's more likely that I'll get selected for uh, market competition. 
I'm more likely to need uh, political influence, so I'm also going to invest more in my social network and uh, you know, similar intuition for uh, V. However, while you know, I'm just showing you this diagram to give you a sense for uh, the qualitative nature of the results, what we have in mind is um, sort of a, a developing country um, that's experiencing sort of rapid li liberalization and economic development, uh, such as any number of countries we can think of, but these uh, um, parameters change in different directions. So G usually goes down at the same time that M and V are going up. Uh, so as markets develop and as uh, you know, um, opportunities for market competition increase, uh, it's usually the case that you know, government friction is also going down because of liberalization and so on and so forth. So these changes work in opposite, sometimes in different directions to each other. Um, so you can also think about another one more a sort of comparative static result, which is what happens as the influence of the political network uh, goes up. Um, and again, in this case, this is a little more complicated, and it depends on um, um, whether, you know, at, at that, you know, at that point, you uh, are investing a lot in your social network or a little in your social network. If you're investing a lot then if political uh, influence goes up, it might actually pay off for you to invest less uh, and invest more in R&D. Uh, so there's a threshold uh, level of investment in the social network on uh, either side of which uh, the comparative statics for changes in political influence are, are different. So, um, as I said, um, you know, I've already talked about this. So, um, so we have a model and we're now trying to think about how to um, you know, bring it to the data. Um, we're still working on this, but what we've been able to do is uh, assemble uh, some detailed case studies that match uh, you know, aspects of our model. Hopefully some of what I've told you rings true. Uh, you know, we believe that this kind of phenomenon is common in many countries where uh, you know, there's government friction, there are sort of uh, ethno-linguistic or regional uh, sort of tribes or communities and so on to which people belong. Um, but we've been able to find good case studies, you know, based on the sort of um, ethnographic and anthropological literature from Jordan and from South Africa. Uh, both of these are countries where